Hello everyone and welcome to video number three on paleoautoecology or the ecology of fossil species. Let's jump right in. So paleoautoecology broadly reflects our attempts to try and understand the mode of life and the life traits, including the breeding and feeding of fossil species. Okay? We do this primarily through a thing that we can call functional morphology. That is, deducing the function of part of an animal from its morphology, from its anatomy, from its external appearance. So what we're trying to do is understand in this process how morphological form in these animals is related to their function. Let's start by choosing a living example to show how we can combine lots of pointers to get a clearer idea of the mode of life of an animal. This living example on this slide here is a very handsome creature called an axolotl. It's an amphibian. You can see the juvenile form on the left hand side here and the adult form on the right hand side. So we can tell from looking at this animal that it lives in water. It's got external gills that are used for breathing, um, which is something that we would not expect to see on a land animal. And it's got a nice flattened tail. You can see most clearly on the left-hand side here that looks like it's specialized towards propulsion and swimming through water. So these are the kind of clues we can use when it comes to paleoautoecology. In fact, this is quite an unusual amphibian, if you're interested, because it um, because its adults remain both aquatic and gilled. And it's weird very generally, because sometimes the juvenile, shown on the left here, doesn't actually undergo metamorphosis at all, because it can breed as a juvenile. So kind of weird when it comes to uh, amphibians. Okay, so that's an example on a living um, group of organisms. And this, this approach works because organisms adapt to reflect their niche. And often within any group, that will lead to a distinctive morphology. Um, and it's one uh, a kind of a distinctive morphology that we can derive from first principles about uh, how we know uh, or how we can um, surmise this creature probably had to live its life based on the morphology that we see. How flexible organisms are and how much they change their anatomy to reflect their environment does differ across the tree of life. And we have to remember that animals, um, organisms more broadly, are also adapted to particular lifestyles within an environment. In this example here, you can see two animals that are adapted to living in Arctic environments, and that they have some common adaptations that reflect that mode of life. They are, for example, both white, meaning they're camouflaged against their background. That's an adaptation towards living in the Arctic. But they also um, play different roles in their ecosystems, and they will have specialist adaptations to reflect those roles, despite both living in the Arctic. So um, an obvious one is going to be in the nature of their teeth, because they eat very different things. This polar bear and this Arctic hare or rabbit, I can't actually remember which, sorry, um, will have different teeth that reflect the food that they eat. Okay, um, And so... In the recent past, we can often also inform these attempts at understanding functional morphology and ecosystem roles by using uniformitarianism. So this is the idea that processes that are happening today happened in the same way in the geological past. And as I mentioned in my very first video, um, th that becomes harder and harder to do the further we go back in time. Okay. Let's have a look at how we can actually apply this in a real world example. And let's do this by looking at some very ancient organisms. So these are um, Paleozoic trilobites. These are trilobites. That's a group of animals that lived in the sea that were around from around 520 million years ago to about 250 million years ago. So very much an extinct group. But this is really interesting because the trilobites develop over geological time different morphologies that are associated with their mode of life. Trilobites are a really, really diverse group of organisms. They, they make up the majority, we think, of marine species diversity, the majority of known marine species throughout the period from 520 to 250 million years ago. And they show extensive convergence amongst the group. We see the same forms appearing repeatedly in different lineages. These are things that we call ecomorphs. And these reflect the convergent evolution in different groups of trilobites towards the same life strategies. And I've put some examples of those on the slide for you here. 
starting on the left hand side here, you can see that we have some swimmers here. We think these are trilobites that swam in the water column because they have very big eyes, the technical term is hypertrophied, and they reduce um, the, the kind of the, the lobes at the side of their body here. And we think both of those are specialization, uh, specializations towards their lifestyle in the water column, um, allowing them to see um, broad angles and allowing them to better swim. The orange trilobites that are shown here are members of a group called the Elenaeomorphs. That's a hard word to pronounce. And these were smooth. And we think those were probably um, associated with carbonate environments. We think the, the kind of the, the uh, other than the head, they buried their body in the sediment and left their head resting on the surface. And the adaptations that we see, the smoothness is a reflection of, of that. This blue trilobite here is an example of an atheloptic taxon. These are taxa which have or species that have reduced eyes. And we think as a result of that reduced eyes, they obviously didn't rely on vision very strongly. And we think that means they probably inhabited deeper water habitats. The final example on the right hand side here are the elenomorphs. These are trilobites that had thin exoskeletons and these could be associated with life in um, dysaerobic, so low oxygen environments. So this is a really nice example of where we have morphological convergence in different groups of trilobites, which has an adaptive significance. A good example of paleoautoecology writ large. If you want to read more about this and get a, a fuller explanation, these two references uh, will allow you to do that. So even with extinct forms from first principles, we can make sensible deductions. But also, do bear in mind that changes do occur in morphology, which can't always be explained so easily. Um, so if there are lots of spine trilobites, as represented by this beautiful fossil um, shown in this slide here, um, which uh, develop morphologies and forms that we can't explain so easily easily. There were clearly lots of selective pressures applying to the trilobites, many of which may be adaptive, but other ones, um, if they are adaptive, they don't allow us to necessarily infer the mode of life of these trilobites particularly easily. We don't know what the purpose of these gorgeous devil-like spines in this particular trilobite species were. Okay, And we can actually, using the latest computational techniques, apply this kind of approach to organisms whose affinities of, who, of which we are completely uncertain. Um, if you have seen my videos or been to one of my lectures on Ediacaran fossils, you know that these are fossils um, of organisms that predate the origin of animals. And we have a very limited amount of certainty as to where these sit on the tree of life or indeed what their mode of life was, how they made energy, how they contributed to their ecosystems. But using some really, really clever new techniques, we can still deduce elements of their mode of life and specifically in this example, how they breed. This is based on a beautiful paper that was published in Nature in 2015. You can see the, the um, reference for this paper here. And that paper uses a super clever approach of spatial analysis to investigate the distribution of fossils of a, which are members of a taxon called Fractiofusus on a bedding plane. The graph on the left hand side here shows a thing called a pair correlation function. And this shows that shows on average how far any um, individuals are from any other individuals on this bedding plane. And it shows essentially how they are distributed in space for different size brackets of individuals from large to medium to small. And it showed that there's a very strong preferred pattern in how these organisms are distributed from each other on this bedding plane. And we think they were preserved on this bedding plane in their life position, allowing us to do this kind of analysis. This analysis suggested that these animals were sessile, so they didn't move around. They were, were recumbent. They, they kind of lie on the bedding plane, and they were benthic. So they were based on top of the um, sediment water infl interface, and they have this mode of life in aggregated communities. And what's really interesting is they seem to have a hierarchically clustered organization on their bedding plane. So their, their distributions suggest that you had organisms, which were the oldest ones, um, which are the biggest ones in this ecosystem, that then 
there was evidence of those reproducing asexually via lateral extension with juveniles, the smaller one, attached to their parents, the bigger one. And that happened at three different size brackets. So the bigger one um, put out asexual, um, asexual instances of, of, of their taxon, and those in turn put out further instances, and that leads to a size-based clustering and a predictable spatial relationship. Isn't that neat? So despite not knowing really what these organisms are and how they relate to other things on the tree of life, we can still say something about how on the on the basis of probability, on the basis of this spatial distribution, how they reproduced and how they lived their life. And I think that's a really nice example of paleoautoecology. I hope you've enjoyed this video. In the next one, we'll be talking about gradients. So I'll see you there in a little bit. Have a good one.